So let's talk a little bit about uh, Movember and uh, Men's Health Awareness Month. Obviously, as you know by now, this is the month that we promote and we raise awareness for men's health, particularly prostate cancer, which is uh, the number one cause for cancer in men uh, age 55 and older. So I thought it'd be good for us to record this video, give you some data, give you some basic information, maybe helpful to you, maybe helpful to your family member, your father, your uncles, your brothers. And so we're gonna go over some data, some uh, uh, studies that were done, and then we're gonna also talk a, lot, a little bit about finasteride, which we use for hair loss. I'm uh, especially wearing my little mustache here. It's not uh, very thick, but uh, that's just thought that I would put it on in honor of the month. So first of all, what is the prostate gland, right? Prostate gland is a little, it's a little organ, a little gland that sits under our urinary, urinary bladder. So if you look at the picture here, is this little, this little green thing here, right underneath the urinary bladder. And so if you notice it, it kind of straddles the urinary canal or the urethra. So normally the prostate gland produces the semen, which is obviously the liquid part of the ejaculate. And uh, it's important for male reproduction, obviously. Sometimes with age, it can get larger. That's called benign uh, prostate enlargement or benign prostatic hypertrophy. It's just a medical term for enlarged prostate, very common in men as we age. And what it does, because it encircles the urinary, or I'm sorry, the urethra, when it gets bigger, it may constrict that. So a lot of times men, when they're older, they start to have from some urination problems because of the prostate enlargement. They start going to the bathroom many times at night and they have, you know, just a trickle of urine. It's hard for them to get the flow of urine going. That's because the prostate gland is compressing the urinary canal or the urethra. It can also be a source of cancer and uh, prostate cancer is very prevalent and we're gonna see later on. So we need to uh, do some screening tests. It's very easy to diagnose or to uh, do these tests. So we're gonna talk about the appropriate ages and the recommendations for that next. So what are the facts from prostate cancer? This is uh, from the American Cancer Society and from the National Institutes of Health. About 200,000 cases are diagnosed every year in the US. I'm, I'm only talking about the United States, okay? There's about 35,000 deaths yearly in the U.S. from uh, prostate cancer. But the good news is if you have a localized prostate cancer, that means just in the prostate, or even if it's spread to the lymph nodes around the area, the survival rate, which is uh, you know disease-free after treatment for five years or longer, is nearly 100%, according to the sources that I, you know, the NIH and also the American Cancer Society. However, if you didn't diagnose it uh, early enough and then it spread to other areas like the lungs, the bones, for example, or the liver, then the survival rate is much much lower. So again, just to kind of emphasize the uh, importance of early diagnosis and screening. What are the risk factors for prostate cancer? If you're a man, of course, you have to be a man to have a prostate. Uh, age greater than 50, it, you're a higher risk. If you're an African-American man, you're also a higher risk. If you have a positive family history of prostate cancer, you are at increased risk as well. I have my father who had prostate cancer, also one of his brothers, one of my uncles on my dad's side also had it. So I'm a higher risk. Uh, and I've been having my screenings done for a while already. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There are also other causes that are not really strongly correlated, but they, they seem to play a role in the instance of prostate cancer. There are genetics. There are some genes now that are being, the, being discovered that could be, if you have a certain mutation or genetic mutation, you may be more prone to the prostate cancer. That's still being studied. Uh, obesity, smoking, uh, dietary factors such, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, in the past used to be that uh, people that uh, ate a lot of these uh, sweeteners could have bladder cancer and prostate cancer, but, um, you know, none of that is, uh, is for sure. There's also a history of prostatitis can put you at risk for prostate cancer, and sexually transmitted diseases is also a, um, a risk factor. So how do you screen for this, right? So the guidelines, again, by the American Cancer Society and the National Institutes of Health are as follows. If you are over 50 and you have um, no risk factors other than just being a man, then uh, 
after your 50th birthday, you need to start having your yearly PSA test, the blood test, that test for the prostate uh, antigen, and also your uh, digital rectal exam. So if you have no risk factors, uh, after age 50, you need to have an yearly prostate check. If, however, you're African-American and you have either a father or a brother, meaning a first line relative, with prostate cancer that had the cancer after age 65 then you need to start screening yourself after age 45 so you start screening a little earlier and if you are uh, a high risk patient so if you have a father or brother a first line relative that had prostate cancer at an early age earlier than 65 years of age then you need to start screening after age 40. so these are important because we need to follow those guidelines because you know the earlier detection is key for survival as we will see later. How do you screen for this? A uh, very simple blood test, it's called the PSA. I have some values here just to kind of show you. Uh, just as important as the number itself is the trend. So if you follow up with your primary care doctor or a urologist, which is, which is a specialist in prostate, uh, in prostate cancer, they will do uh, the PSA values and they'll plot them in a, in a curve. So the trend is important because sometimes you can see a slow trend of increase of the PSA and that can sometimes alert more than the number itself. But as a general rule, if your PSA is less than 2.5, it's considered normal. Nothing to worry about, just watch it. If your PSA is between 2.5 and 4, then that's a kind of a attention. It deserves attention. You need to follow up a little closer. Maybe do your PSA every six months instead of every year. And certainly if it's over 4, then you need to investigate. So your doctor will be referring you. If it's a primary care doctor, refer you to a urologist for other tests. Okay. If you have your PSA between 4 and 10, you have a 25% chance of developing cancer of the prostate. If you have a PSA that's greater than 10, you have a 50% chance of cancer. So those numbers are important, just so you know, there are guidelines, you know, every situation is different. It depends on your, again, your family history and your risk factors, but those are the general uh, rules. The digital rectal exam is also a very commonly done uh, screening. It's the uh, uncomfortable test that uh, we, we have done every year. It's very important because it can provide your physician with very important information. The size of your prostate, if there is any regularity in the prostate, if there are hard areas, those are all indicatives of a potential problem. And then uh, there are some genetic screening that's being, that are being developed now that might be available uh, for you to do as well. Okay. So, but the, the gold standard as it, it is right now is the PSA and the digital rectal exam. So, once you have a suspicion of a prostate cancer, how do you diagnose it? The first thing that you're probably going to go through is to have maybe some imaging studies, um, an MRI or a CAT scan, uh, maybe an endorectal MRI, which they put a probe through your rectum and they uh, look at the prostate under greater detail. Also, a uh, transrectal ultrasound is very good also to see if there's areas of the prostate that are different than others, that, that might be a tumor. And if they show up, then you can have biopsies of the prostate. So through the rectum, the doctor will go and it will take a series of biopsies from many places in the prostate. Usually those biopsies are guided, are guided by ultrasound, so there is a better chance of hitting the, um, the tumors. And you can also have, if you have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, then they're gonna be, uh, you're going to be doing some you know, bone scans, MRIs, maybe PET scan, just to stage to see if you have any spread of the disease. The PET scans and the bone scans are also done periodically after treatment of the cancer uh, to check for uh, the spread. Treatment, once you have a diagnosis of uh, prostate cancer, whatever stage, then the doctor will define your treatment. So, you know, most of the time surgery is recommended if it's not too advanced. Conventional surgery is done, or also robotic surgery. Um, those are the new the methods that are available for surgery. Radiation therapy can also be done in conjunction with surgery, sometimes by itself. That can be done through the insertion of uh, radioactive little ovules inside the prostate gland itself, which will then burn the prostate. Sometimes they'll get you a, more, uh, a, a larger area that needs to be radiated. It all depends on where you are at the stage of the diagnosis. Also, sometimes they'll do chemotherapy, they may do hormonal therapy or immunotherapy. So those are the treatments available. And again, there's a high cure rate and a high survival rate as long as you detect it early. So 
That's what it says here. Early detection is the key to survival uh, and also effective treatment. Do not skip their prostate exams every year. So then um, one of the things that I hear a lot from patients that I consult for hair loss is, okay, I hear from the internet that uh, the drug that you want to prescribe for my hair loss, finasteride, which is the old Propecia or uh, even older, it's called Proscar, Finasteride is used to treat prostate enlargement, has been used for years, and then uh, more than 20 years ago, it was also indicated for hair loss. So for the treatment of prostate enlargement, a man will take five milligrams of finasteride a day. For treatment of hair loss, it will be one milligram per day. So the data I'm gonna show you here to answer those questions is, is based on the five milligram dose. So, but we can sort of, you know, extrapolate that to the one milligram. So with a little bit of a careful data interpretation. So when I prescribe finasteride to my patients, I always ask them about any family history or personal history of uh, prostate cancer. I warn them about a few particularities that we will talk about uh, in a little bit. But finasteride is generally very safe and it can be used without any fear. So what is male pattern hair loss, uh, benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Uh, they are all both related to a hormone called DHT, dihydrotestosterone. As you can see in the little uh, schematic here, once we, uh, when we were born with a genetic predisposition for hair loss, for male pattern baldness, which is what I see every day at the office, um, we carry the genes and then in puberty, we start producing testosterone, the main, the main uh, androgen or main uh, male hormone. And then this testosterone gets broken down by this little chemical here, 5-alpha reductase. It gets broken down into dihydrotestosterone, and then the dihydrotestosterone will bind to the susceptible follicles, hair follicles, and it will make them miniaturize or shrink over time. Therefore, you have hair loss. So in order to have male pattern baldness, you have to have DHT and you have to have genetics. One without the other does not cause you to lose your hair. Okay, unfortunately, a lot of us men uh, have the genetics and we all have DHT, so uh, hair loss or male pattern baldness, as you, as you know, is very prevalent. So one thing to be aware of that's very important, if you are taking finasteride and you um, go start having your PSA tests, you need to let your doctor know about the finasteride because the results of your PSA tests will have to be adjusted. When I started uh, doing my PSA tests, I was already on finasteride. So my numbers are my numbers. As long as I stay with the finasteride, they will stay consistent and that can be followed the trend. However, I have a lot of patients that have had a baseline PSA without finasteride. Let's say that was one, right? Just for the sake of argument here. And then they start taking the finasteride. A year later, they go to their doctor and their PSA is still one but they forget to tell the doctor that they've been taking finasteride for the last year, since the last PSA. Well, when you have finasteride on board, when you're taking it consistently for your hair loss or even for your prostate enlargement, uh, that will uh, lower your PSA level by about 50%. So if, I, if my baseline PSA without finasteride was one, and my PSA now a year later with finasteride is still one, in reality, it's two, so the doctor will take, pick up your results and it will multiply by two. So it's very important because you don't want to miss an increase in, in factuality. In this situation, the PSA actually doubled from one to two. It's just that the number still shows one because of the, uh, the action of the finasteride. That's the only thing, it's very important that you understand that. So make sure you tell your doctor, your urologist or your primary care doctor, whoever is taking care of your prostate, that you're taking finasteride, okay? Now, how does finasteride affect male pattern hair loss? This is a little graphic of a study that was published by Merck, the manufacturer of Propecia, the drug that was originally uh, launched in the market for hair loss, for male pattern baldness. So finasteride, one milligram, was uh, launched under the name finasteride. And they, uh, of course, Merck did many studies uh, for validation of treatment and everything like that, like they're supposed to. And this is a, a curve that's very interesting. It shows follow-up after five years. So I'm gonna kind of take it through this real quickly here. So this is baseline right here. You can see where my little green thing is showing there. There are two groups in the study, the placebo group, which were not taking finasteride, but they didn't know, and their physicians didn't know either. And then there was the treatment group, which were also taking finasteride, actually taking finasteride. So if you look at the, if you follow the curves, the Propecia or the finasteride group, 
their hair, this number here is hair counts, okay, over time. And this is time here on the X axis. So if you see the, the finasteride group, their actual, their hair counts or the number of hairs actually increased over time. And then they plateaued. And then there was a slight decrease as the years passed all the way to about five years when they stopped following them up. So that means that finasteride is very effective, actually got their hair better, but with time, genetics and DHT still win the battle. So there is a little bit of a downward trend to the curve. However, if you look, if you compare to the placebo group or the non-treatment group, which is the lower curve here, you'll see that their hair counts kept on decreasing for the most part. And the further you go in time, you see the delta here on the hair counts, it keeps getting better, and, uh, uh, larger and larger in between the groups. So it's very important um, to understand this because finasteride is very effective for hair loss. We use it all the time. I've been taking it for over 20 years and I recommend to a lot of my patients. So the data supports their safety and uh, their effectiveness. We actually did uh, publish a study. I was part of the re of our research group and we published this study here called the effects of finasteride one milligram on hair transplantation. So the hypothesis is that patients that have transplants, hair transplant and take finasteride, they do better than the ones that just have the transplants. So as we expected, it showed that the patients that have finasteride on board, they're consistent with their treatment since they are not losing their active, they're not losing as much of their native hair as time goes by the transplants will um, look fuller, they'll have a better result because they still preserve their native hair. Transplants don't need finasteride because they come from this, what we call donor zone, which are hairs that are genetically different. And so they don't carry the, the receptors for DHT. So they will not look, they will not fall out, they'll not change after you transplant them into the top. But the native hairs here, they will continue to thin out unless you do something about it. And so uh, those, the studies show that patients that took finasteride did better when they had their transplants too. So that was what we expected, no big surprises there. And then there was an issue, some questions were asked about finasteride and the uh, either the incidence or the risk of prostate cancer and also the mortality. So uh, back in 1993, a study was designed, uh, actually it was a little earlier than that, but the first uh, uh, article that was published, it was about the design of the prostate cancer prevention trial, or PCPT. Very, very important. This was a uh, landmark study that was done. So basically the study was designed to follow up patients. Now these patients were on five milligrams of finasteride, okay? Not the one milligram that we use for hair. They were on the five milligram dose, which is used to treat prostate enlargement. So they, it was a randomized control trial, meaning that there was a group of treatment and a group of placebo that were not taking the drug and they were blinded. They didn't know which ones they were taking. The groups were very similar between them. Uh, there were 221 research sites across the US and they enrolled almost 19,000 men uh, in the study. The criteria for enrollment was uh, men ages 55 and older and uh, they, had, they were gonna be on finasteride for five years taking it daily and they were going to follow them up over a period of nine years from the start to check for the incidence and for severity of uh, prostate cancer well in 2003 seven years be, uh, after the study was started so two years before the original in, uh, uh, intended endpoint the study was actually stopped because when they looked at the data, they saw that the patients that were on finasteride were having a much lower incidence of prostate cancer compared to the control group. So at that point, when you reach that into a study, it becomes unethical not to offer the treatment to the, to the control group and keep observing them once you found out that it's so effective in the, in the treatment group. So sometimes you see studies like that. They will be stopped because uh, the group is doing so much better, the treatment group, than the control group or the placebo group, that they'll stop and then give it to everybody. So that's what happened. The first uh, follow-up study was done uh, in 2003, was published at the, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it showed a significant decrease in prostate cancer incidence in the patients that were taking finasteride, so a protective effect. However, it raised the question of whether these patients had more severe cancer when they had it. So to answer that question, they kept following up. The consensus was that the finasteride group didn't have a higher mortality or didn't have anything worse on their cancer. What they had was they had better diagnosis because finasteride keeps the prostate volume, the volume of that gland smaller. 
So you are more likely to detect the cancer when you do a biopsy because you have a smaller mass of tissue to biopsy to sample from. So it increases your accuracy of diagnosis. Um, and so that was the reason why they thought that the, some of the patients showed a more aggressive cancer. And that was uh, confirmed when they did further follow-up. Uh, another study was published in 2013, as you can see here. It showed that there was no difference in mortality between the finasteride group and the placebo group. Still, there was a protective effect on the incidence of cancer, meaning getting cancer or not getting cancer, but the mortality was the same. And finally, in 2019, there was another article uh, looking at the survival rate for the two different groups, still uh, looking at the data from the, the PCPT trial, and it did not show any difference in mortality. So, if you hear out there, wow, you take finasteride, you may not get as many pro as much prostate cancer, it may protect you, but if you get it, it's gonna be worse and you're gonna you know, have a, a worse outcome, that is not true, okay? Now, there is something that I hear also a lot from my patients, it's been all over the internet, it's called the post-finasteride syndrome. Post-finasteride syndrome means that some patients report, and there's been some, uh, some really kind of questionable studies that were done, uh, on finasteride after using for a long time and patients have depression, they have long-standing erectile dysfunction or sexual dysfunction, and they have all sorts of problems even after stopping the drug. Um, it's never been sufficiently proven that this is real. I do have, I have had patients because I treat so many and I prescribe so many, so much finasteride. I have had patients that complained about this, all sorts of side effects from insomnia to being too tired to feeling like they couldn't stay awake all sorts of things but normally when they stop it they go back to normal the most common side effect of finasteride is low libido uh, lower libido and also um, uh, problems with erection or erectile dysfunction so the post finasteride syndrome it's probably more scary than it is in reality however if a patient is concerned about that i counsel them that uh, it may happen, it's been reported, we just don't know how prevalent it is and what is the cause of it, or even if it's real enough. So, but there is, it's, a, it's a significant fear for patients. And of course, if somebody tells me I don't wanna deal with finasteride at all, we have to respect that. But just so you know, it's never been really proven uh, categorically. So what are the final thoughts on this? Number one, do your screens. If you have, if you're a high risk, like we talked about before, do it every year, start earlier. Don't miss out on this. Uh, and of course, if you have, uh, if you don't have any high, any risk factors after uh, age 50, you should start having your prostate checks every uh, year. So do not skip on that because it can literally save your life, okay? If I can be of any help, if I can be of any assistance with this, uh, let me know. We have some uh, uh, information here on where to follow us. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel. We have a lot of new, another uh, cool information coming out too. So this was more of like a, you know, public service thing. I wanted to educate you a little bit on these issues. So follow us on the on the YouTube channel. Sign up and uh, subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.